Cool. Thank you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing myself because we don't have a lot of time and that's that's not really kind of my style but you know my I know several of you in the room basically you can take most of my background and and slice it up into two parts of my career one was being a part of building Proforma and the president of Proforma for 18 years and then part of a group of people that kind of formed Brand Alliance over the last 10 years in Canada I've made a decision to get into my own business and you know, basically the reason that I've got into my own business is I've spent most of my career representing one business model and I really want to spend the last eight to ten years in the last phase of my career really representing several business models because I think we're geared for some exciting times and I think there's more than one business model and it's, so really my focus if you were to go to my website is connecting resources and talent. Um, one of the things that I've done is I've written an ebook called Life Force Your Marketing Agency which was the name of this uh, session. And the reason I've done that is I think, I think there's, I'm gonna call it an opportunity, and there's also a risk. I think that there's an opportunity for, the, for people that have gotten into their own business, built their own business. There's an opportunity to prepare that characteristics of that business for maximum resale value. And then there's a unique opportunity in Canada that not everybody's aware of called capital gains exemption. And and I'm not gonna I'm I'm not I'm not gonna get into that in a whole lot of detail, but the, the long and short of it is is I think there's some things that as people become educated that they can focus in on to continue to build their business with the end game in mind. And not that everybody's end game should be to sell the business, and certainly if you were to talk to the Small Business Administration, they would tell you that the majority of small businesses never get sold. They people work them, they kind of slow down, and as they slow down, the business slows down, and, and, they, and they shut the business down. And so, so I'm going to get into that a little bit. But what I want to first of all do is uh, move fast with a couple of questions. So the agenda that I had for today, and I'll, and I'll expedite it a little bit, is I want to spend you know five or ten minutes getting to know the participants. I'm not going to go around the room with introductions, but I'll, you'll see the style. I want to set a realistic outcome for the next hour. An hour is not a lot of time, so I'm not going to try to bite off more than we can chew and then actually end up accomplishing nothing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the principles of valuing a marketing agency. Um, there is, it's, not a, it's not a science, but there, I think there's some principles that as we all become familiar with it can help us. Um, and then I think there's some concepts of growing value and preparing for the succession. Because sometimes you can grow a business, but the characteristics don't lend itself to be sold and, and transitioned. Um, and then I'm, I'm not going to really promote my book, but I'm going to share the book, is, the, print, the sections of the book are Decide, Evaluate, Enhance, and Win. And although there's a lot in the book and a lot of materials and links and videos and strategic partners, professionals uh, um, uh, that, that contribute and so on to that book, to me it's, it's a whole mindfulness and, and a process of constantly, you know, making decisions, evaluating, enhancing, and preparing the business to win, whatever that definition is. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that, I'm not trying to define what winning is for the individuals, but helping with the process. And then I'm going to talk about some of the summary of resources and kind of a closing concept. But um, in getting to know, first of all, how many, if you can put your hands up, how many of you are principal owners? So I'm just trying to get a, a sense. So we've got you know, a number of you that are principal owners. And of the other people, how many of you are involved in the sales side of the business versus maybe the sales sort support, so the sales side of this. So it looks like we have principal owners and sales people. And I would tell you the majority, not all of, but the majority of what we're gonna talk about today applies to both of those audiences. We obviously have, I, I can tell, so I'm going to streamline through this, I think we have, everybody in the room here has significant experience. And I think many of the people have over 25 years and so on. How would you, how many, for the principal owners, how many of you would say, 
are within three years of wanting to success in your business. Anybody that's in that time frame? No. Okay, you? Okay. And then how many would be maybe in the three to five year time frame or say the 10 plus year time frame? 10 plus year time frame. Okay. How many of you, and I'm not looking for personal and confidential information, but how many of you perceive your business to be one of the top three biggest assets that you own? Okay. And then how many of you actually view it as an asset? Meaning that it, um, you know, I find a lot of people have a lot of assets. They have, you know, you know, uh, uh, portfolios of investments and so on that they really view as an investment and they plan and so on. But when it comes to their business, they're just kind of working in their business and they don't really view their business as an investment and something that they actually measure uh, as an asset and that they consider about the ability to eventually you know, liquidate that asset. I mean, how many of you kind of view the business in that way that it, you really view it as an investment and an asset and take the same kind of approach to that that you do? Okay. So I want some really, really quick hits. What's the three biggest changes facing our industry? Consolidation. Internet. China. What's that? China. Okay. <laughs> Those are three good ones. What's, what's the big, what's your biggest fear? Uh, Bears going direct. Uh, I would say uh, the larger industries that are on and uh, the companies getting into So, would I be exaggerating if I use the word disintermediation? Disintermediation is one of the terms of that where you have a supply chain. So like, you know, the office products industry, the sporting goods industry are two prime examples that used to have layers and layers and layers of reselling channels, and now there's not layers and layers and layers. Yeah, I think it's the cost, the cost for like the Okay, okay, cool. What's the biggest opportunity? What would you say is the biggest that's uh, that faces this industry right now. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Anybody else can think of? Be creative. Okay. Okay. I know at least one person in this room that's built their business by through acquisitions. Would it, would it be fair to say that we have a, uh, you know, like a lot of industries, we have, you know, quite a disproportionate amount of people that own the businesses in this industry that are, you know, in, in within the last 10 years of, uh, of their careers. And so, you know, an opportunity is to actually be able to help participate in the succession of those businesses and be a solution rather than a, than a threat. What's your biggest goal for this session, other than the fact that you get one and a half points or whatever have you towards your, your CAS and your, and your MAS? A few people just toss out your, 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 you know, what may be attracted to you to sitting in on this and what would be the one thing that you would want to get out of it? So you hope maybe to either get a, 
I don't want to say necessarily learn a few things, but get exposed to some things and some resources that might help you and your son figure that thing out as, as, you, as you work through. Okay. Any other major objectives? <laughs> the other 20% is um, that, uh, that I create um, tools within the business that I can leverage the 30 years that I have yeah. in the industry yeah. and to educate and to, um, and, to, and to share that I don't have to be going out doing the work or doing the seeking engagement each time to yeah. be able to be confident. Something that's scalable and repeatable and enduring based upon. Uh, my grandfather used to tell me, Alan, if you're lucky, you're going to spend half of your career getting paid for what you do, and the other half of your career getting paid for what you know. And uh, so I would agree with that. Um, so I'm going to share from my perspective the way that I've kind of geared this. The, the number one objective, if nothing else, I hope that you at least get some sense or some opinions. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not. This is absolutely not a science, but some sense for the potential value of your business as an asset and maybe some thoughts around being consciously aware of your business as an asset and the decisions that you make and how they contribute or detract from viewing it that way. Um, I would say the ability to grow it. I think quite frankly even though in some ways our industry is not getting any easier, I think the opportunities to grow it are like never before. And, and so I hope to touch upon a few thoughts of, uh, of, the ability to, uh, of the ability to grow it. And if you know where you're going and you know the characteristics of what is going to increase the likelihood and the value when you get there, then when you grow it, you're growing it in alignment with that. Because there's nothing worse than growing the business. There's a lot of businesses that have grown a lot of business, but at the end of the day, they're the last one that gets paid and, or doesn't get paid and at the end of the day the characteristics of their business don't lend itself to a successful transition and all they've done is spend a heck of a lot of time and energy and, and, and work. And then again I'm just going to reinforce and then I'm going to expose you to some resources. There's not time to go through the resources but I want to help you understand the gist of the resources and the intent of, uh, around the resources and the idea of a constant process of, uh, of deciding, evaluating, enhancing, and winning. And I know that you've probably, if you're like me, I mean, I listen to Tony Robbins stuff all the time. I think he's freaking great. And, and all the stuff that I hear and so on, it it's really comes down to decision making and conscious and, and learning how to say no as much as learning how to say, you know, say yes. Um, okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk a, l a little bit about business valuation and and I'm not going to get into minutiae but I'm going to talk about some principles and I would tell you first of all if you go on to alanchippendale.com and then if you were to click on the ebook all of this is in the ebook so all of the links to all of the documents to all the templates to everything there's no cost no nothing it's all on there, you can download it. You can do it. You know, you can do whatever you want. There's some really good videos from you know the, the gal earlier was talking about branding and messaging. One of the best companies I've come across is called Story Brand, and so I actually engaged in a strategic alliance with them, where there's actually e-learning uh, courses and things like that that are all tied into the ebook and a, and, and a, uh, it's called On Strategy, which is a business you know planning and execution type tool and some, so some really neat stuff that uh, that is in there for the resources but um, and so what I did was put together this document this document was designed and I you, you don't have to read it because you can't read it from where you're at but it, it allows you to go in it allows you to, to understand some of the principles that allows you to put kind of where you're at today and it allows you to get a sense from some of the three different principles and all I want to do is talk about the principles a little bit and then again, you can you can go and you can work with uh, this type of stuff. But I'm a big believer that it, the more you focus in on the value of your business as an asset, not that it's ever perfect, then you ha it, it's a report card. It's a benchmark. It's something that you're you're measuring yourself against. It's something that keeps you really disciplined 
and and really focus. But there's there's three basic principles around valuation of businesses. One of them is a percentage of gross profit. You know, many of you know Barry Holtz that was very involved in in, in Canada and uh, they're certified marketing in the States and there's some professionals that have been doing this for an awful long time. And so what I'm suggesting here, and, and I'm giving some wide ranges and I'm going to discuss some of the principles, is that a business, really at the end of the day, your business is going to be worth the ability for you to transfer cash flow. I mean, the more cash flow that you have in your business and the more that it's tailored to be transferred, the more the value of the business is, and it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure that out. And where gross profit is used as a valuation principle is more often when somebody's looking at fundamentally whether they do a share purchase or an asset purchase, they're buying the account base and the goodwill, and they're not planning on taking a lot of the overhead with it, and they're going to leverage the overhead against you know the infrastructure and so on that they have in in uh, in in place and so then gross profit is one of the valuations the range of gross profit valuations i'm suggesting is anywhere between 50 and 120. And so i'm going to give you some ranges and then i'm going to come back and talk about some of the principles around what determines whether somebody's at the low end of the range or the high end of the range so if you've got a million dollar business at three hundred fifty thousand dollars of gross profit the valuation of that business through a successful transition may be anywhere from half of that to 1.2 times that. And then in Canada, if you structure it right, you've got $850,000 per shareholder of capital gains exemption. But you have to be able to align the use of the capital gains exemption against the income that's coming in so it won't be done as an event because Santa Claus will not show up at the door with a $2 million check. And so, you know, I'm of the, of the opinion that what you want to do, you, when you're gearing up, I'm going to say anywhere from three to five years ahead of succession in your business, you want to have a strategy in place where you can sell the business over a period of time, obviously to a, to a trustworthy resource and everything that you've kind of lined up. And then as you're receiving the income, whether you're still active in the business or not, for the valuation of the business, you're able to slap it up against the capital gains exemption. And, and a well thought out strategy uses every nickel of eligible capital gains. And so I was talking to a fellow this morning, his wife's not a shareholder of the business. His wife's going to become a shareholder of the business, because <laughs> then you have two times that that you have eligibility and it happens to be in his particular case the makeup of the business warrants the ability if done properly over a period of time that they could you they could they could draw up against you know uh two times that um out of the business the second uh, actually i'm going to jump to the bottom one so at the, at the simplistic stages you're getting paid a percentage of gross profit some of it's guaranteed some of it's up front some of it's over a period of time you're going to see a balance of risk and reward in, in all of these scenarios. The more traditional method is as a percentage of recasted earnings. So that today, probably as a business owner, you're kind of, you know, unless you're purposely building up the retained earnings in the business for certain reasons, you're finding ways to distribute as much out of the business as you can while keeping enough working capital in it, in it to support it. And so typically, in, in a, in, if you were to go to an M&A person, it doesn't even have to be a big time M&A person, but a, you know, a small business M&A person, they're going to say, give me your financials, blah, 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 and they're going to try to value the business based upon the historical financials, and they're going to recast it, meaning all the stuff that you've stripped out of the business, what does it replace somebody else to do that, to take it over and, and recast it and do a multiple. I would tell you in most cases, when you see that number, you won't sell your business <laughs> because it's, it's not going to be, you, you're going to say, you know what, for that, I'll work it for a couple more years and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and milk the cow. And that's why more often than not, the only time multiple of earnings is used is on much bigger businesses where, where you're not just uh, taking over the account base and the goodwill, but you're taking over significant assets and there's significant tax strategies and things that are gone in. And then in the middle is what I call net contribution. And that's, you know, gross profit minus the selling expenses. And, and so again, 
the point that I'm trying to say here, there's not time to get into it, go in, use a tool. I'm happy if you, if, if you want to walk through the tool or whatever have you. I'm, I'm not here to make a living off of helping people walk through tools. Um, I'm happy to, to, to kind of do that. But I think it would, could be an educating thing and can be something that can help you uh, stay focused. But part of what I'm trying to illustrate is, is that the value of your business, if structured right, <laughs> and if transitioned successfully over a period of time, may be a lot more than you think it is. And, and then in Canada, which applies to these people in this room, if it's structured against the capital gains exemption, you actually get to keep it. And, and, and so if nothing else, I would say, if you haven't put at least some thought into this, regardless of whether you're 15 years away from looking at succession in your business, I suggest you put some thought into it. I think there'll be enough tools in the ebook and so on that you can at least get started. And then you may have a, you know, some, uh, some professional advisors that are quite skilled at this as well. But the difference between being focused and doing it and realizing it and, and just kind of continuing to run the business and then not thinking about it till you're ready to sell, it's too late when you're ready to sell. It's too late to use the capital gains exemption because the only way you could use the capital gains exemption is if somebody guaranteed 100% of it, gave you the full maximum value and gave it to your hand the day you did a deal, and I can guarantee you that won't happen. Um, and so it really is, if there's one messaging from this, there really is one that that's you know, probably the most important thing that, uh, that you could do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over that because we're... The next thing I want to do is focus in on some concepts around going, growing value. So I'll say that what you want to do is you obviously want to have good margins. You want to have strong what I call net contribution. You want to have the ability to transfer the business. And, and let me give you some almost like silly, stupid ex extremes of that. If, if you're sitting there and, and you've got a bunch of salespeople and they're all independent contractors, you better be milking the cow now. Because in all intents purposes, you fundamentally don't own the business. You own the business of the, of the service fees that you're charging and the ability to be profitable off of those charging, but at the end of the day, you don't really control the accounts, you don't really own the accounts and the goodwill, and, and you could try to create a strategy to sell it to the independent contractors, their own books of business, but I can tell you from experience, uh, most of the independent contractors, because they're independent-minded, they view it's they're their accounts, and they're not likely going to want to buy them. You know, from it, and that's why a lot more of the. Although for a long time, people were structuring as independent contractors as a way of kind of getting around the tax system and employee taxes and less liabilities and all of those types of stuff. But both in Canada and the U.S., you know, CRA and IRS are kind of buckling down on that, and then more and more of the companies that are following this kind of a concept, where they're trying to create a transferable business of value, are structuring you know, with proper um, proper employment relationships and proper employment agreements and, and attracting the kind of culture of people to that that, 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 uh, that very much uh, uh, value it that way. The next thing I want to do is um, one of the tools that I have linked into the book is is I'm calling it a revenue asset model. So you have the valuation model, which looks at your business, the cash flows, looking at the different principles and the ability to prove that. And then you have the revenue asset model, which really focuses in on assessment of your customer base, of your key accounts, of your sales talent. And then I've put together what I call opportunity rankings. And I just want to touch on these. And so if you're looking at building the value of your business. And it's the same thing if you're looking at building the value of your sales assignment. And if you're looking at penetrating your accounts and growing your accounts. I mean, obviously one way to do it is focusing in on sales growth. And, and some of the tools that are in this revenue asset model focus in on 
account penetration and different types of tools and things to assess the accounts and, and your knowledge of the different areas and uses within the accounts and your presence within them and strategies of that. Again, I would say one of the things that I've seen, um, you know, uh, I'm going to say best, I'll call it best practices of top salespeople and top distributors is they're, they're very on top of that. They're very strategically thinking about the account, the value that they're bringing to the table, the continuity, new areas of growing, and, and what they're doing is they're hitting, you know, they're combining two things. The best defense is an offense. You know, the best defense away from somebody coming in and, you know, going on a contract with somebody else and walking away with that business is, is being proactive and penetrating the account and, and expanding your scope of contacts and all of those things in there. So there's some tools that are built into the ebook and so on that focus in on that. There's gross margin improvement. I would, I would tell you that uh, um, it used to, I, I see margins of best practices actually going up. You know, and, and I know people talk about pressures of margin and certainly there are pressures of margin. But I would say the best of the best distributors and salespeople that I see are selling now at 38 to 40 percent margins because they've honed in on where they're, they're offering enduring value and, and in penetrating the accounts and things of that nature. And then when you look at the cash flow of your business, you may be better off actually having lower sales at higher margins than having higher sales at lower margins because higher sales at lower margins usually leads to more support systems that are necessary to you know to manage that uh, workflow processes and things of uh, you know things of that nature yeah 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 now i think I, I personally i think that world's gonna change a little bit um i think that i i think I think that the supply chain and, that, and the information systems are going to eventually come together, and there's some movements of it. And I, and I think that, you know, in my opinion, the problem in our industry is not that margins are not good, they're great. The problem is the frickin' workflow and the transactional process and the billing and the payables and receivables and the cash flow necessary, and the fact that I think most distributors lose, every, lose money on every order under 500 bucks. That's the problem in the industry. You know, one of, and I'm not here for a commercial, but one of the organizations I'm involved in in, in the human performance engagement rewards and recognition space has a whole platform where everything's on a payment system. All the constituents, the customer, the, the, the reseller, the, everybody in the supply chain is all on a payment system. It's all set up. It's all, you know, uh, done on, a, on an ongoing uh, float uh, account. And there's no billing, there's no payables, there's no receivables, there's no duplicating information, there's no nothing. I don't know that that idealistic is coming to the promotional products industry in, in, in my career, but a lot of movement's going to go there. So I do think there will come a scenario where people, where maybe the margins may get lower, but the efficiency is going to get a lot higher. I can tell you I was involved in Vegas with a couple of clients that I'm working with with some strategic discussions, you know, with, you know, with uh, HIT and PCNA and Alpha Broder and so on, and the incentives that are going out to communicate electronically are massive right now, with discounts and 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 rebates and specific incentives to connect electronically because everybody wins when you when you connect electronically, and and I think more and more customers are looking for that as well. Um, I know you talked about the big players and whether it's the Amazons or the Walmarts or whatever have you and yes we can look at them as the, as the big bad boys or whatever have you almost like the the uh, uh, you got mail uh, uh, movie long time ago where the big uh, uh, you know bookstore comes in and puts a little bookstore out of at the end of the day that's the experience the customer wants and it's actually the experience you want too you just want you want to be a part of it you don't want to be, you don't want to be cut out of it. Go ahead. Question for you on what you just said about communicating electronically. Is that from a standard or is that something else? Well, I, again, I'm, I'm not here to portray that I'm an expert, but I can give you my own opinion on it. I, I think, like, you know, when I was at PPAI North American Summit, you know, I, and then I was there kind of just being quiet and watching, and, and people like David Nicholson from PCNA, the number of key suppliers that are getting involved in PPAI like never before and and I think that's the reason for it so 
I know that there's some suppliers that are way ahead of the game and they're trying to make sure they understand the principles around promo standards so that they're not doing something that's going to disconnect, but they're doing something that's going to connect. But I also was around when ASI Transact spent lots of money, so I'm not a believer that everybody's going to love each other, put their arms around each other, and, and, and the big players are going to pay the bills for the little players to play on the same field with them. Ain't going to happen. So I, but I do think that they're, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's a mapping of information that's flowing in, but there is already today, I'm going to say with probably the 12 of the top distributors, and I'll say 12 of the top suppliers, there's already significant levels of testing and, and data integration that's going. Is it perfect? No, but it, it's massive. So, you know, you know I, I, I would say, and I, I'll exaggerate, I would say orders under $700, nobody makes money. And if you looked at the number of orders and the percentage of orders in this industry under $700, you'd choke. And, and so I think that no, even if we make 20% movement in that area, then 30% movement, then 50% movement, and so on in those areas, the impact of it is massive. And it's also in alignment with what the customer wants. Whether we like it or not, the customer wants an immediate experience. And they want to know where it's at, and they don't want to follow up with it. I want to play telephone tag with somebody 50 million times. Well, oh, that's uh, to your point. That's a lot of people poo poo um, uh, for Ember, but they have actually leveraged that technology like nobody else, and that was at least 10 years ago. Uh, and if you knew the model, you would sit there and say, everybody thinks that they're doing it below cost, and in actuality, they're making amazing profits. But uh, leveraging the technology and the partnering with the vendors that do that. Just give them such a, a foothold, it's remarkable. Yeah. Well, all you have to do, I mean, all this information is public. Go into four imprints and look at their margins, and go into staples and look at their margins. And you can see the difference between somebody doing it well and somebody not doing it well. And you can look at the EBITDA numbers, and, and the impact of doing that on the EBITDA numbers is massive. Well, just to uh, find that margin. Yes. You mind if I disagree with you a little bit without yeah. without being without being critical? I I think the answer is you need all of the above. I think the answer is is that uh, uh, an efficient uh, let's call it, uh, you know, dot-com scenario without the ability to work strategically with the client and be the trusted guide, guided advisor for the client only has so much. But I think we need to be careful that we, that we don't underestimate what's going on. So I can tell you, like for instance, with 4 Import, they've, they've got quality, talented people, they got massively outbound information, they got intelligence that's going on by watching what's going on, they've got automated waves, ways of feeding ideas and so on to the client, and um, I mean, like, I don't know, how, how many of you use Amazon Prime? Right? And so I, I would say that I would agree with you that, that uh, I think, you know, for just, if, if you want to become the Amazon Prime, but you don't really want to have a relationship and so on, you're still going to, they're going to be wildly efficient and they're going to be profitable. And let's not fool ourselves, although we think we're actually consultants in every one of our cases, let's take a step back and, and, and see what the trend is, how often we're seeing the customer and how much is through email and how much we're quoting on and so on. And I'm not being critical, uh, but I, I think there's an unbelievable powerful opportunity to combine you know, high tech and high touch and, and I think we need to come up with an answer of high tech as the supply chain as a whole. And then, and then every hour that we take away from, I'm gonna, the bullshit of billing payables, receivables, and vouching, and reissuing this and that, and everything, and chasing this down. Every hour we take away from that, that we free up, 
to um, you know to work proactively with a client as a trusted advisor. And I think over time, the skill sets that we're going to need from salespeople are going to be different. And not that I mean most salespeople now they spend more time on learning the products than on learning the customer. And and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that that's not important or whatever have you. But eventually, with artificial uh, uh, intelligence with participation of merchandising with the suppliers and everything, the stuff that's going to be available to the end user client is going to be far superior than any human being could ever do themselves. And therefore, the skill sets that's going to be necessary for working with the client is understanding the client, probing, understanding the business, understanding the application, I forget the, the name of your book, but the, 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 the things that you are talking about. And that's the power that we have. When we have the ability to develop that efficiency and that integration and that scalability and experience and in addition to that be that I'll just call it that trusted advisor then that's the point of differentiation the people that can do that I think are going to be you know are, are going to be are going to be very successful and I, and I, I literally like I've heard without mentioning any names I've heard you know combined rebates up to 15 percent that are going to be available through, and, 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 and I was involved in several meetings and many of you were in in uh, in uh, PPAI, you want to know where were the leaders of those companies in PPAI? They weren't in the show. They were in strategic meetings with top clients, and that's why you know Alpha Brothers rents rents out uh, House of Blues and you know has a, has a machine you know uh, going on there. They're looking to go like this. It's somewhat of a race for the suppliers to go like this because that's going to be so much rigmaroles going on to try to incent and bribe salespeople to use certain suppliers and rebates and sharing rebates and you know PK sessions and all this kind of stuff when in, in the reality that whoever gets connected and the cost of doing business goes down and the incentives go up and you've got the pipeline built that's going to be the biggest influencer and then when you can feed merchandising together through that pipeline efficiency that's going to have a greater Influence on where the business is is going is uh, is going to go. Alex, to your point, not only do our clients, the clients do that, or want that, our suppliers want that too. To your point, um, give me a quick example. Four imprint never follows up on orders. Never follows up on orders. And you think about that. If I'm a supplier, and I used to be one. Not to have to hear 15 calls on the same order, I've got to hire somebody to handle that order. Order print doesn't follow up on orders. How powerful is that to know that I get a perfect order that comes in, it goes out the door in seven days, it's done, and it's built. Now that that's to that that level of efficiency is, and people don't really understand how much money that saves a company a year. If you think about it, how many orders does Vic take in a year? Yeah. Hundreds of thousands. To be able to streamline that, but not having to answer the phone when somebody is sending them a ton of business. Yeah. Mark. Yeah. So again, I'm I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, but I'm saying there's a lot to be learned of what's going on there, and and uh, I think that I think that we need to, if we want to have more and more, of the end users are going to consolidate who they're dealing with. Their decisions are not only going to be based on who they like and who has the neat, great ideas but who's got the pipeline and who's got the experience and who's got the wor- the, the credit worthiness and everything that, uh, that, uh, that, goes along, uh, that goes along with it. And so I do think, um, you know, I, I, I think it was maybe you, somebody said, well, it's one of the biggest threats is going direct. Um, I, th- I think actually there's probably more of that going on than meets the eye, but I'm, not, I'm actually not critical of that. At the end of the day, everybody has to, has to do what's right for them. I think that actually uh, either the distributor channel is going to get on board with this or they're going to get passed. And, 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 and there's going to be some individuals that are going to get on board with So I can tell you the meetings that I've been involved in, these suppliers are more, yes, they want to deal with the best distributors and the right kind of volume of business, but they want to know who's getting on board. And their decisions and what they're offering is based on who's getting on board who they're going with, and who's going to who's going to not only go north together, but who's going to cut the cost of doing business out together, and 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 I suspect what's eventually going to happen 
is many of these major suppliers are going to start once they've got the pipeline built they're going to offer all kinds of services that are going to empower distributors of all caption sizes so i think some of the models that are going on out there of providing you know support services and things of that nature and, and program services and logistics and all that kind of stuff i mean at the end of the day some of these big suppliers they're logistics companies well, I think, I think, I mean, I'm seeing there's more consolidation going on and more discussions going on than I've ever, ever, ever seen. And I, and I think that that's, you know, that that's going to continue. But I, I would tell you that you don't have to just be big to be, to be attractive. In fact, sometimes, and I'm, I mean, well, again, I'm not here to mention any names, some big organizations that have a, you know, that have a bunch of wild Indians, I mean, you know, I'm just joking happily, you know, that, that can't be corralled and, and, and can't be governed. That's not where the opportunity is. There's going to be a lot of companies that are even going to be a million, two million, five million type companies that are going to be well structured ahead of the game and getting on board and being true partners that are going to have valuations for their business and options for their business, in many cases, bigger than some of these networks and so on out there that have you know 100 100 million you know shapes and shapes and sizes i mean i was in meeting I'm working with a company of states that's a 15 million dollar uniform company that has a 15 million dollar promotional products piece and some strategies that we're doing on that and 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 they're there on technology and they're integrating with the best suppliers and so on and what they're being offered even though they're not delivering volumes that i was accustomed to at a at a performer or at a brand alliance or whatever have you those they're the stuff the opportunities they have because they're on board and they're being some of the early adopters to some of the stuff is is uh, is huge and so I mean I, I I do think that eventually I know CJ from Hit feels eventually you know some of this is going to come together I mean you're going to have some models that are going to have some suppliers and distributors coming together in a variety of different ways and I and I think that will eventually happen now whether it's through a third party you know private equity or whatever have you that's going to end up owning um, I know I'm, I'm personally involved uh, with HIG growth that own, that now owns a company called power to motivate which I'm involved in who also bought out um, Norwood and Vic you know so you're, you're going to see some of that whether it's you know visible on the surface or not well, uh, Alan, how, how do you perceive the, uh, the future of the business from a small distributorship as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, and obviously I feel a lot of distributorships in Canada have lost for four or five years. Uh, how do you perceive the future? Uh, you, sorry, you were saying I promote you? Yeah, so the, they're not taking over distributors. Well, no, they're, they're they're providing resources. They're yeah, empowering yeah. distributors. Yeah. Uh, cliff, cliff. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, 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 no. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But that uh, one saying that in five to ten years, I'll be able to extend the pipelines and stuff. How do you foresee that like a smaller distributor fits into that scenario? And do you, what would you recommend to a smaller distributor in the business? Well, it's hard to stereotype, but I would say in, it looks like in your case, yeah. you have a succession plan within your family, yeah. right? And, and, and if I were to read between the lines, this business has done well for you, yeah. and you want it to do well for at least one more generation, if not more. Sure. Um, I don't think that's an impossibility. Um, I, think that, that, I think that what you want to do is... Uh, you want to plug into the research if you think you're going to do it by developing all the resources yourself your own way i, I wouldn't i wouldn't recommend that because you just don't have the wherewithal to build that you know without you know without taking time away from you know the the, the revenue stream that's supporting the uh, the business but i do think there is going to be options where you get you're gonna I, i'm gonna say there's gonna be options where you're gonna almost be able to tap into everything whether you do it and you know the guy sitting on the left there has been very successful in being involved in in performa and and i'm not here to i mean i performa is one of my clients 
you know, so I'm not here to do a commercial on that. So I think there's going there's a growing number of groups that are out there with different focuses. That, that I, I think the days are over for I'm gonna say BS, where it's a buying group that keeps doing everything the same way but wants to go like this. I, I think those days are are short lived, but I think there's gonna be options there, and I think there's gonna be options for you to work. My advice is is that you work with the stronger suppliers. Like for instance, something like, you know, I would say, take wearables and take decoration. Don't fight the world. Don't try to do your own decorating and run around hell's half acres and shit, but work with the suppliers that have integrated the best in class decoration in with the order, have it processed as one transaction and, and, and do what's necessary. You'll probably have to do it through promo standards versus by yourself to be able to integrate and those types of things. And I think as long as you do that, and you stay focused on who your core customers are and the value that you're bringing to your core customers, I think, quite frankly, you're going to be fine. And, 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 and I would say don't try to be something that you're not. So one of the mistakes I see with some smaller distributors is they try to compete in the big accounts and the RFPs and so on. And it's, you know, what, why even spend any time on it when you're not going to win it? You know, you, you just... The criteria for it is just not something that the small people are going to be, you know, are going to be able to play. But there's a massive opportunity to service the middle market and 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 do that very well. And uh, but I, I would say be aware of the resources that are available to you. Be aware of the resources of you know what all you know dot com e commerce or whatever that are available to you. Don't try to you know. I'm not a big believer of you know building it all yourself, doing all your SEO yourself, and all that kind of stuff. Because every hour away is just it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a waste of time. But I, I'm not a believer. I think the the the, the people that are going to end up consolidating are going to be the mid-sized distributors that are too big to be small and not big enough to be big, and they and they're in that in that middle that middle ground. And they're also the ones, quite frankly, in most cases that are not, not, you know. 40, 45, 50, whatever have you, and they have a big enough asset that they're trying to li say, okay, what's the risk versus reward of continuing to do it all by myself? And I think some of the offers that are coming, more and more private equities coming and so on, I think some of the offers that are going to come to those people, and, uh, and there's going to be different kinds of cultures and find the right fit, are going to going to be hard to turn down. And I don't personally think, I think some people feel like, you know, that's almost like giving up. I don't know that it's given up. If you know, I, I think one of the most wisest things for people is to is to know when it's the right time to hook up, and then to realize the the fruits and the rewards for everything that you know that that somebody has built. And I and I think there's going to be a lot more options, and you know some of them will fit culturally and some of them won't fit culturally. Um, but I, I I'm not I I think I think this industry. Has you know has some really bright, bright future ahead of it. But I agree with what I saw in Austin, Texas. We, there's some of the resources and the supply chain needs to become efficient, and it needs to do it really quick. Because I think the uh, I think that some of these alternative uh, solutions that are gearing up uh, are, are 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 is a snowball effect. I mean, you look at, I mean, if you talk to any of the key suppliers, the growth rate of their dot-com customers is substantially higher than the growth rate of their traditional customers. And the ability to integrate with the dot-com customers is more in line and, and, and they're more capable of doing it. And therefore, oh, there's a lot of energy going, you know, going into that, uh, you know, going into that space. Um, I guess what I and you know we're almost uh, and again this is not a this is not a commercial for me. Um, truthfully, I'm 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 kind of making my living. I'm working with about eight of the top fifty distributors in a variety of different ways of recruiting talent and mergers and acquisitions and helping get in, get them into the human performance engagement side of the business and that kind of stuff. I'm not you know I'm not really looking for you know a lot more customers and that kind of stuff. But I did put this book together. So this, at the at the last page of the book, it actually gives a summary and a link 
to all the resources that are strategically packaged through the book. So for instance, in, in the one section of Decide, and some of you, some people may think this is corny, I purposely don't, um, but, you know, so I've chosen two, Tony Robbins and then and Tom Grover, who's the guy that, uh, uh, um, uh, shoot, what's the name of the business, uh, blanket. he's the one that coached Michael, um, oh, God, what's it called? Oh, I'm having a blank. But anyways, there is some really good video and a, and, a, and, a, and a questionnaire there that has some really good, not lengthy stuff that really is good summarized at, at, at helping you to guide, to make decisions and, and the thinking around the decisions. Because everything starts with you deciding what you want and then structuring and organizing yourself to go get it. And, and this business is so crazy where we get hit from 20 angles and get disrupted all day long that if we don't watch it we're not making decisions we're making, letting everybody else make our decisions for us and i would say the, the reason this book is focused around that is that's where it starts if, if that doesn't happen the rest of it's not going to happen then what the book does is it walks through a whole bunch of tools on helping you evaluate your business anywhere from evaluating the methodologies of, value, of valuing it from your assets to doing a SWOT analysis and, and so there's a there's a document in there that actually is if I don't mind it's, I think it's well done it's not overly complicated that helps you understand the strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats and using some of the honest feedback that you have yourself on that in leading towards some of the initiatives that leads into you know kind of your plan and some of your decisions and the tools that are on there are all it's all templated it's all there you can use it and and go from it and then there's resources from on strategy which is a really neat e-learning and e-platform for you know, strategic planning of, of different shapes and sizes and then there's some I, I did invest quite a bit of money for myself and then I put it into the book with uh, StoryBrand. And if you look at the links of StoryBrand, and you, it really focuses in on positioning yourself to be a trust advisor, some of what the previous woman talked about of finding the pain and helping, and, and not actually, you don't want to be the hero. You want to position them to be the hero to relieving the pain. But there's a whole series of e-learning videos and training focused in on understanding your messaging, coordinating your messaging, positioning it and training your staff and so on to become that, you know, that trusted advisor. And, I, and, I, and the reason that I put that in there is I, I think at the end of the day that's going to be the difference between people that are adding that kind of value to the client and those people are going to be stronger in combating, you know, dot com and things of, uh, you know, um, things of that nature. Um, and then in the enhance, there's there's actually in in story brand, there's actually brand scripts so, where, so that as you go through the process of story brand and you segment some of the profiles of your client and you understand the seven step process to positioning yourself as a trusted advisor where you can actually then go back out and print out and have actual scripts where you can you can use that as a guide to strategically thinking about a specific customer a specific segment of business and and uh and so on that you uh that you have and then there's a section in there i call it the life force relationship value curve where it talks about you know you know from from you know more or less be, you know buyer type relationship all the way through to the trusted advisor relationship and the, and the different ROIs and segments of business because I, I do think that just doesn't happen. You don't just walk in the door and become that trusted advisor. It's a process and therefore it needs to be a conscious process and a trained process and something that becomes part of your culture of working with to kind of penetrate the, uh, the, uh, the accounts. Um, so what I'm going to do um, I'm going to stop there.
and I'm gonna and I'm gonna go right to here because I wanna I wanna give a chance for there's a lot of talent in this room as we're here for maybe the last eight minutes or so or whatever have you. So I'm gonna start off by saying I think this industry re remains healthy. I think it remains fun. I think it can be very rewarding and opportunistic, but I think that it requires like never before to be prepared. So I think that, you know, I've, I've been in the industry for decades where, quite frankly, the, the phone rang off the hook, the economy was booming. You know, you keep on hiring people, you keep on giving raises to people every day. I mean, that's one of the challenges that I see going on right now is, is that, you know, uh, over a period of time, the, the sales support, the customer service, the program support, these kinds of people were, were consistently kind of given raises and so on, you know, through the years. And now the tendency is to become more efficient, to in some ways put order entry back on the sales staff because now we have the tools and the systems that there's no need to kind of duplicate it. We've, we've now got a more efficient process of working with production with suppliers, so you don't no longer need somebody that's making 60 grand a year, you know, to do that work. And I think that I think there's actually a profile of staff, that, a very valuable staff that has in some cases actually done all the work for many of the reps and things of that nature where some of those positions are kind of getting squeezed out and I think it's an opportunity for have those people become more you know <coughs> because they've been servicing customers and penetrating customers and turning some of those people whether it's into inside sales or or account managers and things of that nature so that's one of the things that uh, uh, that I see but what what um, what would each of you share with each other with regards to if, if, if you if you were to say what's the you know the one or two pieces of advice that you would share with others in the room here that you think has been part of what you're focusing in on so that you can thrive into the future you know based upon some of the things that we talked about I mean I'd love to you know I don't want to put anybody on the spot but I know that each of you and, and I'm not asking for people to share confidential information and you know details but I, I'd like for you to also to walk out of this room in the next eight minutes or so, learning what some of the best practices and focuses are of, of each of you, because to me that's what this kind of a you know an organization's all about. It's it's uh, it's learning from each other. I would say first thing, uh, honesty is a huge factor in the whole business that I built up in 2017 along the way, and uh, I feel that in the 27 years I've been in this business, I, of course, I came across a few dishonest people, which really bothered me. And I were still came on in this business. Some people might know, some people might know. You know, as I'm saying, you know, that's how it's been. So I've always been honest. My father used to say, I've got to know what you're going to come for. You wake up in the morning, you take two heads in front of that car, Much Guinness? Uh, probably that as well. But I mean, uh, I think it's a little bit that. And obviously, you've done a good job. Customer service is being lower than that. Time is always right. Well, you know, I, I, I'm going to take advantage of what you just said. I, I think that for some in this industry, particularly on the distributor or the sales side, people are very protective. And I think that I. Uh, I think that there, you need to pick and choose who you trust in the supply chain and you have to go like this. And you have to go like this. Because the people that go like this and become go like this are going to win. And the people that go like this, it's, it's, it's going to be tough. Oh, that's a great I love it. Travis Dawkins, I don't know. I don't know him well, but I'm familiar with yeah. him. Yeah. Cool. Then don't tell too many people Cool. Go ahead. You know, I just want to comment on your question earlier about you know what's the future of an independent distributorship, and I don't necessarily think that there's a threat to a good, well-run company. Um, you know, all this electronic data interchange is going to happen. I mean, everybody's trying to get with the times, but I don't think that suppliers will necessarily isolated and independent because of it. I think their cost of doing business reduces with those key distributorships. 
and those organizations will get benefits. It's kind of like the next EQP, right? So because it costs them less, they may get a little bit of better pricing, but they're still going to be willing to do business with their client base. They're not going to ask them that. So I think there is a future there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I could probably see where, you know, a promo standard becomes like an organization like ASI where they're able to lease their software which has that data interchange so that smaller distributorships or independents can still take advantage of it. So, so I, I, I do agree, I think the future is still bright regardless. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, we talk about that Amazon experience and it being so well and customers like to do business with Amazon because it's, it's flawless, right? So, so I think good organizations and good distributorships that make it easy to do business with will continue to thrive and the ones that don't will continue to disintegrate. Um, so uh, I hope that gives some... Oh, uh, maybe I did it all. Actually, you said earlier on. No, no. We actually had 27 years. I think it's Shayla Pepper last year. So I know I saw your son. Your son you for takes full credit for that, I think. <laughs> That's usually the way it is. <laughs> I think Bryce can do the same thing. <laughs> no, it's a fabulous thing. I've loved this first for the first four years. Cool. Any, any, you guys want to share anything? You don't have to, but if you want to, we'd love it. We're, uh, we're on the supplier side. So? Well, your perspective counts too. <laughs> I just find that the, the ones that you have good relationships with stay with you. Right? Yeah. So you still got to get out there and it's for you know. And yeah, the, the whole fear of going direct, well, that's a fear for us too. Right? Yeah, well, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's, so it's, it's, it goes. It's a perfect yeah. example for us. Yeah. yeah. They went from being one of our biggest customers to basically our competitor. Yeah. So things like that, that we, we look at that as on our side, they will, you know. Yeah, they go to, they buy all their stuff direct overseas. Not all of it, some of it. And they buy the parents. Yeah. But yeah. a big part of their stuff is basically they went direct and then started cutting out all the suppliers. Yeah. So they, they were like, well, we don't want you to go direct to our customer, but we're just going to go right ahead and buy all our stuff direct and screw you guys. So that took, that, that was something from on the supplier side where we were like, the hell now? Because if everyone decides to do that, then we're, as suppliers, we're crazy. And that's where, so we, we try to, you know, we, we value our relationships with the distributors and hope that they're not going to be, you know, basically, you know, that, that whole two-phase thing. Oh yeah, you guys are great. We get all our stuff from you. Meanwhile, you've got, you know, a container full of crap that you just bought from overseas coming in your back door. Guess what? The end users lie too. <laughs> cool. So let's let's keep going. We just got two more tables. Any comments that anybody wants to share with the other group? You know, when I being in the industry for a while, or just being in business for a while, like the you know, it's become really clear of two things. And one is being really clear of who you are and being very good at what you do. You know, and not trying to be everybody and not worrying about the competitors. Just creating a really good version of what, whoever you are, you know, because we all have our own skill sets and our own interests and, you know, just being clear and just following that path. Um, and uh, I, I have an article on PPV this, this month about, um, about valuing your time. And that's that's been, uh, I'm a bit of an efficiency freak and I don't like opening the same file 15 times to follow up on orders. It drives me crazy. But um, when I see inefficiencies like that, it, it, you know, I'm always looking for ways to improve that because I really value our time. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, we have, we, we get, you know, heard it a million times, we all the same 24 hours a day. I would rather turn away business that doesn't belong to us, it's yeah. not ours, so miserable people that don't pay their bills and be on the golf course, then take that business. You know, I value my time too much. So yeah. I think that putting yourself and saying, I'm going to be myself, I'm going to be very good at what I do, and I'm going to deal with people who value and appreciate that, and the rest of them are not part of what we're going to do any business with, you know. Yeah. It means saying no, and that's, yeah. that's okay. Uh, I was going to say okay. this but uh, what I find is that like, some of this is just not relevant for I understand. Me, but yeah. my forte is dealing with uh, small and medium-sized distributors. Yeah. 
and whatever health or education I get from here, I can pass it on. And as in there, it's needed in the last four. And so I find that very good. I'm sorry, you're with? I'm with St. Rich's Group. Okay, okay. So you're, you're with a, a consolidating mm -hmm. supplier yes. that is gaining in its services that it's offering okay. to empower the small and medium sizes. And that's I find smaller medium distributors are yeah. amazing to grow yeah. with and yeah. relationships with, and they're the ones that need more support. So I do a lot of research and stuff for their end users yeah. and their target yeah. market, and then I recommend products and things. Yeah. And I do a different type of selling. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever works for whichever type of customer. I do the PK sessions and stuff too. Yeah. A lot of stuff I do is very distributor related. No, that makes a lot of sense. I work in the marketing side for a supplier. Uh -huh. So I'm basically just here to learn about who we're selling to and how to meet their needs. And you're, I'm sorry, you're with? Uh, Botanical Paperworks, we're a CD company. Oh, okay, cool. We use CD for promotion. We also have a retail side as well. So my job is very all over the place. And for the promotion industry, is something I'm just kind of learning about now. So yeah. it's kind of fun here this year. Well, good for you. This is the Very place to be to learn about. Interesting. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. I think that Amazon has really elevated everyone's expectations. Prime service is an example. People want responses and stuff now. So part of our, I guess, commitment to manage our customers is speedy service in everything we do. So if you email us for information or a quote, you've got it the same day, 20 hours max. So I think expectations have risen. And this is a good thing. Like it makes us all get on our game, connect, and find efficiencies in how we communicate from up and down the supply chain right to our customers. That's what we're working on. Yeah. Speed of service. I would just say that uh, I think the thing that I would leave for everyone is, and I've been in this a long time too, is don't become complacent. And uh, you have to constantly to reinvent yourself right now. If you're not doing that, you're going to become stayed very quick and you're going to become irrelevant very quick. Yeah. And sometimes I have to have a filter to decide whether I actually want to come out with something that I'm thinking <laughs> that or not. But, uh, um, and this, this is, I guess, intentionally an extreme. I, you know, getting back to the decision, I, I think irregardless of the size of the distributor, it's, it's time to get in or get out, and 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 getting out is is not a bad thing. Like I mean, I'm working with a distributor right now of eight hundred thousand dollars with strong margins. That's going to move on to uh, take over his father's uh, business, and um, you know we've structured a deal and gone out and so on, and and he's going to get you know three hundred sixty grand over three years with it with some take his working capital out. He's going to. Um, you know, he's going to have some fixed payments each year over three years. He's going to have some variable payments over three years. And, um, and, and that's, in essence, you know, probably around, you know, three times what he's been taking out of the business. And, and, he's, and he's going to go take over another business. And so I would tell you that the, there is an appetite for, for decent accounts and opportunistic accounts to be transitioned. And so I would say that, you know, the worst thing somebody can do is stay still and not get in the game and lose what they have. And so I do think that, 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 that irregardless of where people are at, I, th I think, you know, the only advice I would have for people is, is get a little bit more meaningful and mindful and then make that decision. And, and I think there's going to be, I think, you know, not just because it's part of what I do, I, th I think there is going to be... A lot of people, when they think of consolidation, they think of at the t high end, and they think of mergers and stuff that they read in PPA and so on. I, I think that there's as much opportunity for consolidation that you'll never see in the write-ups. And, and, and I think, so, it's, so I think it's foolish, even as small distributors, that we think that, you know, we don't really have anything to speak of, you know, to sell. And every business whether, uh, that's trying to grow their business is, is trying to combine organic growth with what I call external growth. And, and, and there, there's some really good opportunities for, for, uh, for people.
And I have to agree. I, so I've bought two companies in the last four years, and both both the companies I've bought have done really well for themselves by selling. So a lot of times I think the misconception is is that you know I'm just not going to get enough money or whatever the case is. But but I mean, I'd be happy to if, if somebody really wanted to to know or, or talk to any of those people just to get an idea of it. Um, they'll they'll both tell you that uh, that it was a win-win situation, and it has to be right. There's nobody holding a gun to anyone's head. So it is fruitful on both sides. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks very much, and uh, have a great uh, panel for the show. So, Alan, on behalf of the PPPC and everyone here, thank you very much. A token thank you. No problem. Of thank you very much. I appreciate it. Cool.